Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Miguel Perez. I am the head of public programming for the Phillips Collection. Um, I just have a couple house rules for us for tonight. Um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, there is going to be a section, so tonight's going to be broken up into several different sections. We'll do some introductions about tonight and this entire series of our Duncan Phillips lectures. Um, Arlena is going to give a 15-minute presentation followed by a 17-minute uh, um, PowerPoint presentation, and then she'll get into a conversation with our senior curator, Vesla. Um, immediately after that, we'll get, we're going to get into a Q&A, so they will be answering your questions. At the bottom of your screen, at the bottom of your screen, if you hover your mouse down at the bottom, there's a section, a little button there that says Q&A. You can submit all of your questions through there, as long as they're submitted through there, uh, we will definitely get to them. Um, that is pretty much everything I have to say for you guys. Thank you so much for coming, and Dorothy, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Miguel. Thank you so much. So I'm Dorothy Kaczynski. I'm the Vradenberg Director and CEO of the Phillips Collection, and I'm really thrilled that you've chosen to join us this evening. I've been very excited about this project ever since uh, Arlena Davila um, accepted our invitation. So let me start with a little bit of background about the Duncan Phillips Lecture Series, which goes back to 1987, when Lachlan Phillips, wanted to uh, create something, something ongoing and enduring to honor his father, Duncan Phillips, who had founded the museum a hundred years ago. So this is our centennial. And we've tried to make uh, a very special series of Duncan Phillips lectures in, uh, to commemorate this centennial moment. So some of the people who have spoken, so it's always a mixture of artists, uh, art historians, writers. Um, so there have been David Hockney, Carlos Fuentes, Helen Frankenthaler, Susan Rothenberg, Martin Purrier, Bill Viola, Elizabeth Murray, Christo and Jean-Claude, Alfredo Yar, um, Peter Doig, Rick Moody, Eva Lambois, Hiroshi Sugimoto, Sanford Biggers, I think was our last lecture, um, but I might be wrong about that. But so this year for the centennial, which as you can imagine, has been slightly distorted and impacted by this horrific um, pandemic, I would say multiple and interconnected pandemics that uh, our world is confronting. Um, we, we decided to have, to have three. So Arlena will begin tonight. And then in October, the secretary of the Smithsonian, Lonnie Bunch, will be our, our next lecturer tackling a small topic like the future of museums. Um, and in January, as the finale poet and president of the Mellon Foundation, Elizabeth Alexander, will be talking about museums, art, and social impact. Um, so I'm very grateful to Miguel for having organized this. I'm grateful to my distinguished colleague, Basil Strasenovich, who will be in dialogue with Arlena. Um, she is our senior curator of contemporary art, has herself um, um, uh, brought uh, voices of uh, Latinx artists into our programming. So just a little bit about um, professor Elena Davila. She is a professor of anthropology and American studies at NYU. Um, she is the founding director of the Latinx Project, an interdisciplinary space at NYU focusing on Latinx art and culture. Um, her, she, her Formation, her education and includes a BA from Tufts, an MA from NYU, and a PhD from the Graduate Center at CUNY. Um, what, at least from my point of view, I was so eager to hear from her because of her exciting book that came out in 2020, Latinx Art, Artists, Markets, and Politics. Uh, Basil is holding up the book. It's, it's, it's actually fascinating. And um, 
dives into all of the complexities, complexities of language, of culture, of identity, of visibility or obscurity of all the artists of this diaspora from many, many different countries, um, the role of race or of all of the categories by which uh, a dominant white culture um, puts artists in boxes of the, the dominant culture's definition, um, be it language or um, gender or cultural or national identity it becomes really um, like a hall of mirrors. And I'm so thrilled to hear from Arlena um, and look forward to um, hearing her words, uh, her presentation and the conversation um, with, with Basil. So with that, I thank you each and every one of you for joining us this evening. Basil, I think you wanna lead it off. Thank you so much, Dorothy, and good evening, everybody. And thank you all for zooming in into our program tonight. I'm really delighted to join uh, Dorothy's in welcoming Orlin Davila as our distinguished DP lecturer, and moreover, to be in a conversation with her later on. Um, her book that I shown, Latinx Art, Artists, Markets, and Politics is, in my opinion, Tour de Force, an intellectual thriller taking us on a journey of very murky art markets and behind the scene of contemporary art world that is everything but transparent. It is the book that is hard to put down, presenting us with some twists and turns that illuminate the geopolitical, economic, social, racial, and class conditions of art production. And although the main concern of the book is to call out and to question the underrepresentation of Latinx art, a gender neutral term that refers to Latin American descents living in the US, but Arlene will be talking about that much more. And on the current art market, the even bigger question that Arlene raises is how to create a more equitable and diverse art world. As I echo her question, I also like to expand it and ask, how do we create a more equitable society at large? The society where the wealth gap is not so huge, where the class, ethnic, racial disparities are not so prominent, where all genders are equal or have equal status and where access to food, free health care and education is distributed to all. What role can art play in making these social changes given that the art production is only in friction that is an infrastructure of much larger mechanism conditioned by socio-political economic base structure? As we listen to Arlene's presentation, let's keep thinking about what concrete changes can we all make as individuals, as institutions, and thus contribute to the more equitable world of common good that includes the art. With this said, I'd like to take the screen to Arlene. Arlene, welcome. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Vesela, for the presentation and also Dorothy. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the Phillips Collection for the invitation. It's an honor to speak to you as we celebrate its 100th year anniversary and its trajectory of Codinet's collecting exhibitions and programming. I'm humbled to be in the midst of so many former Duncan lecturers and future Duncan lecturers who have thought about art so deeply, even though I consider myself an outsider, a cultural anthropologist, Latinx studies scholar, whose writings have been focused on the political economy of art rather than art per se. I'm especially grateful that Dorothy Kosinski, the Brandenburg director of the Phillips Collection, encouraged me to speak about my recent book, Latinx Art, Markets and Politics, addressing the invisibility and hence the need to uplift and recognize the creativity of Latinx artists. Given that the Phillips Collection has been a forum front runner in exhibiting African American artists and in calling for the, diversi the diversification of its collection ahead of current battles to diversify and decolonize museums, I could not be happier to discuss the plight of Latinx artists at an institution that is open to nourishing conversations around equity, access, and inclusion. I also want to thank everyone who is here with us virtually, the artists that contributed to the book, and Vesela Stratanovic for agreeing to be my interlocutor today. 
So I'll start with a, a short introduction to the book, and then I will introduce the Latinx project, a center at NYU that I created alongside the final stages of writing this book to put into action its goal to create more spaces to address the historical disinvestment in Latinx artists. Now, I started this book in the midst of increased calls for greater representation of Latinx art in US museums and art institutions, among artists, curators, scholars, and activists, whose concerns and activism informed the book. And it's been wonderful to see rising awareness of their issues since I started my research, especially since recent uprisings around Black Lives Matter have brought about a reckoning with racism in the arts and society at large. As we seek to imagine an equitable world in the arts, I expose how the invisibility of Latinx artists affects our ability to achieve the more equitable and diverse contemporary art world and a more inclusive and just society. I ask, how is it possible that Latinx people who make up 18% of the total population remain so invisible in mainstream US museums? where they're not even recognized as American artists? And how is it possible that they also remain invisible in the institutions that were supposed to address their invisibility, such as those that they themselves founded as part of larger civil rights struggles in the 1970s? In fact, cultural activists estimate that relative to the demographic growth of Latinx populations there are less cultural institutions focusing on this population today than 20 years ago as many of them have succumbed to privatization trends and cuts in government art funding, or have changed missions to, suppo to supposedly become more global and marketable. Before proceeding, I want to clarify that when I use Latinx, I'm using the gender neutral term for Latinos and Latinas who are people of Latin American background in the United States. One of the most important revelations during my research was learning how few people actually understood who and what Latino people were in the mostly white spaces of the art world, where there are so few people of color and where the industry worked as an exclusive isolated bubble despite operating from some of the most demographically diverse cities in the United States, such as New York City, where close to 30% of the population is Latinx. Now, Latinx is often used interchangeably with other terminologies, Latino or Hispanic, or not at all but I use it purposefully in the book to index its current currency among younger generations and artists, which find previous terminologies such as Latino or Hispanic less useful for calling attention to Latinx diversity along the lines of gender, sexuality, and race. Here, the X summons a double take, providing for generative questions about inclusion and representativity. Specifically, I identify Latinx art as a project, not a fixed identity, that is social and historically produced within a particular moment where we're seeing rising questions around matters of inclusivity within Latinidad. When more and more we're facing, focusing on the exclusions and erasures of this identity and saying, hey, there are Afro-Latinx, indigenous Latinx too, you must see us too. Most of all, I say Latinx art, when I say Latinx art, I do so to signal the need to find entry points to identify artists who are invisible in the North American and Latin American art canon and who fall in the cracks of these recognized art historical categories for study collecting and archiving artworks, even though these artists have been living and working around us for generations. I also name Latinx art to challenge racializing trends that make it so easy to summon Latinx people as consumers, as voters, or in terms of negative stereotypes of Latinx criminality or, or as migrants, would make us stumble when we think of Latinx art and Latinx creativity. In other words, I ask, why is Latinx art and creativity not a central part of the public imaginary for Latinx people in this country too? Another clarification concerns my methodology. My book is an ethnography of the art world ecosystem involving observations and interviews with dealers, galleries, artists, curators, and stakeholders across the hemisphere from New York City to Los Angeles to Miami, and also in Latin America, such as Colombia and Argentina, where I was doing research too. This methodology I felt is best suited to learn how people talk about, define, brand, and misrecognize Latinx artists in key spaces of cultural production and evaluation across the hemisphere, whether they be museums, art fairs, and galleries. 
I also focused on interviews and oral histories with Latinx artists to elicit their experiences struggling to maneuver, struggling their, their consistent marginalization, um, their experiences in art schools, or how they were misrecognized by dealers or collectors and so forth, both in the United States and throughout the hemisphere. This methodology allowed me a macro and micro perspective of the interlocking spaces affecting the production and circulation of contemporary art, while getting a taste of the chisme or the many informal scripts, formulations, and conventions that rule the art world that are seldom discussed and acknowledged out loud, while allow me, allowing me to draw a portrait of an evolving world that does not pretend to be as comprehensive as much as suggestive of larger trends affecting the contemporary art world. One key takeaway was learning how people in these spaces, curators, galleries, and so forth, would immediately think, think of Latin American artists, artists born and raised, collected and exhibited by Latin American collectors as the only reference for Latinx artists. An erasure that I traced to the so-called Latin art boom of the 1990s, when Latin American art first became a recognized category in the art world, academia, and coveted in art markets, building from the Hispanic art decade of the late 1980s, the start of Latin American art auction at major auction houses like Sotheby's in the late 1970s, and before that, the rise of Cold War inter-American art initiatives throughout the 1950s. Consistently bypassed throughout this development are Latinx artists in the United States. Artists were born raised from those who have lived here for generations or those who are migrants for work primarily in the United States who remain a racially marginalized invisible category in the arts. Also ignore is the diversity of Latinx artists from Afro Latinx artists to indigenous Latinx artists, as well as the original diversity of Latinx artists who live across the United States, not simply in global cities and global art capitals like Los Angeles and New York City. Latinx artists include Chicanx artists, New Yorkan artists, Colombian American artists, Mexican artists, and many artists that have shed their national backgrounds altogether and define themselves as Chicago or Bronx based and more. The book delves into how the erasure of these artists was created and institutionalized in the United States. And my argument is very simple, that it is impossible to understand the invisibility of Latinx artists without understanding US processes of racialization as they play out in the arts. Specifically, we must anchor race, power, and the political economy of art markets that shape white-centric regimes of value and the institutional racism that are inherent to the art world's ecosystem that limit possibilities for artists of color in general and Latinx artists in particular ways. In this regard, I introduced the idea of national privilege as a key element of racialization of Latinx artists within cultural industries were authenticated ideas of Latinidad that favor Spanish language fluency, a whitewashed Latin look, having connection with Latin American home countries, um, which have been historically used to create ideas of authenticity and hierarchies and exclusions in a context where Latin American national ident identities are regarded as more legible, fashionable, and marketable than Latinx and diasporic ones. I especially question the rising influence of national Latin American elites and wealthy collectors in creating and establishing aesthetic value and in shaping taste within a neoliberal art world where money is more overtly involved in making these judgments. I call for an analysis of the influence of the economic realm in the arts alongside the workings of race and racism in the art, arguing that both are central to the evaluation of white artists and the devaluation of artists of color notwithstanding how much the role of economics, race, and racism in creating artistic value is consistently denied. I show how the category of Latin American art is the product of US art institutions and of Cold War geopolitical strategizing, bolstered by nation-centric stakeholders who have had little to no understanding, let alone interest in the Latinx experience of racialization and marginalization in the United States. We see this across the hemisphere, where wealthy Latin American patrons and collectors have long invested in building in Latin American artists by building museums, collections, donating works to major museums across the United States, helping to lift the category of Latin American art. Unfortunately, most of these collectors, even though they have lived in the, in the United States for generations, have seldom collected Latinx artists. Again, this has a lot to do with the racialization of the category, 
one Latin American gallery dealer was very honest when he told me, basically when they think of Latinx art, they think of the ghetto. Now, this is a good time to remember that no one is born Latinx. One is socialized into this category by processes of racialization. And across history, people have shown different modes of identification or disidentification with racialized categories of identity in the United States. And in fact, across history, many people of Latin American backgrounds have used nationality as an idiom of class identity and also to distinguish and separate and racialize against and from other Latinx. As a result of this historical overinvestment in Latin American art, over Latinx art, we see how across the United States, many museums have worked from Latin American artists in their collections, which is wonderful. However, in contrast, when you visit any museum across Latin America, you will not find any Latinx artists represented in those collections, except of the few who have been canonized by the market, such as Ana Mendieta or Felix Gonzalez Torres. This is a key reason why we're generally more familiar with Latin American artists. And this is also true of many other culture industries like film and media, um, where we're more familiar with uh, Mexican film directors, for instance, that we are with Latinx artists working and living in the United States. The result is also the tendency to nationalize Latinx artists whenever possible to make them more marketable. And I always mention the example of Carmen Herrera, but there's so many artists who have been here for 50 years or so that are still described as Cuban born, again, nationalized. So I explore why it is that some categories of identity are more coveted and disavowed in art markets in order to expose the racial dynamics that are always key to these determinations. For instance, I consider the favor for national identities versus diaspora one, but also the favor for some national categories such as Cuban, Brazilian, Mexican and Argentinian artists over those from Guatemala and Bolivia. And likewise, the favor for white Latin American artists over black and indigenous ones. Reviewing this history of this investment in Latinx art makes amply clear that equity demands structural and lasting transformations in the makeup and functioning of all institutions that are part of the larger ecosystem of artistic evaluation. How do we ensure that Latinx artists are, who are uh, have access to key institutions that are centrally involved in creating aesthetic value, that there be part of curricula, museums represented in galleries, and also talked about by the art press. In sum, I challenge the art historical literature that has failed to engage with matters of racism by ignoring the structural dynamics of exclusion in art museum and art institutions that contribute to inequalities, such as the lack of Latinx art writers in art presses, curators of color in museums, scholars in academia. In other words, I say, I argue that we, sh we should, we need to stop making generalizations and generalized statements that take the experience of white and European and international artists as the norm of how the art world works, entirely excluding artists of color and the dynamics that affect their evaluation. Finally, the book challenges a variety of stereotypes about Latinx artists that rapidly limit your evaluation. And these are things I heard from all of the people, many people that I interview. For instance, the idea, the tendency to narrow Latinx art to identity, or the idea that one could or should see identity in their work, or the view that most of the work of these artists is didactic, figurative, or political base, which limited appreciation of conceptual and art abstract artists, for instance. Um, foremost, I found a tendency to exceptionalize a few artists that gain any sense of mainstream recognition around the idea that great Latinx artists are an exception, not the norm. Now, I make various other points in the book, but before concluding this opening remarks, I want to mention one key last takeaway that I hope people take away from, from the book, that it is impossible and futile to narrow Latinx art to a single aesthetic, and that we should not try. Um, most of all, that we should never treat Latinx art as a simple reservoir of Latinx identity. And to make this point, uh, I provide image dossiers exactly to trouble this idea by including a diverse roster of artists representing different backgrounds, Black Latinx, Chicanx, uh, but also working in various genres, aesthetics, and subject matters. To make the point that Latinx art is a social project, it's an intervention, and we should always resist the impetus to narrow its scope, its meaning, and its look. What we should always do is show these artists and really see them. So how do we create more equitable and diverse art worlds? 
I want to point everyone also to explore many of the stakeholders that I identify in my book's appendixes, which are filled with resources where people can learn more about Latinx artists from collections, the cultural organizations, the Instagram accounts, the curators, and the activists. Um, I include organizations such, such as the US Latinx Art Forum, founded by Latinx art historians, uh, we, which wanted to find a space within the College Art Association. Or also, I, I spotlight the work of Latinx digital arch archivists, such as Latina in Museums or Gallery Girls, Jasmine Herna uh, Hernandez. Uh, among many other creative people that are opening up spaces for challenging the canon, by challenging the canon of the art world and creating communal worlds for exhibiting, selling, and, and, and uh, uplifting this work. For today, however, I want to end my remarks by sharing some of the work we're doing at the Latinx Project. And I would like Miguel to help me go through that presentation very quickly by pulling it up. Great, um, let me just exit full screen. Um, so first of all, um, I, I want to start with the first uh, slide, please. Next. Where I want to anchor um, some of the points I've already made about the invisibility and the voids in Latinx representation, even in cities like New York City. And some of the people in this audience may be familiar with the important studies by the Mellon Foundation and the Gottman Center at CUNY, highlighting the disparities in employment uh, for Latinx people in art and museums, especially in positions of power and also the huge gap at the level of gallery representations for Latinx artists, um, even in cities like New York. Uh, next, please. In this chart, you will see in greater detail how not only are Latinx artists and Latinx uh, art professionals missing in museums, but they're also even more invisible in positions of power as members of boards, as directors, as curators those powerful decision-making positions that are most responsible for uh, creating opportunities and as a result, creating value. So that's basically what the Latinx project is. Next, in 2008, as a result of a retention offer that allowed me to access some seeding funds from my university, I basically created uh, what I told the administration was the institute we should have had 20 years. NYU is it's really blessed with vibrant institutes of African American Affairs, Center for Black Visual Culture, the Institute for Asian Pacific American Studies, Center for Latin American Studies, and many other centers. Yet Latinx studies has been the missing link. It was never created and we had never been able to do so. So I basically, when I had the seeding funds created the space. And thanks to generous uh, fund, uh, foundation funds from Mellon and the Ford Foundation, which immediately recognized the need for such a project, we were able to uh, help them. Um, we were able to, to grow very quickly. We now have two full-time staff and three part-time art professionals. Um, and I guess one thing that I wanna highlight, um, we immediately got to fundraise, as I said, um, and I, and I want to highlight that contrary to the claim and excuse that I heard from so many people who were writing the book, the complaint that, you know, you can find Latinx curators, so there's not good professionals out there, that the problem of pipeline, right, that is often used as an excuse. My experience founding this um, space and also hiring the staff is that there's an incredible wealth of talent. In fact, hundreds of people apply for the two positions. Uh, and I could say that um, absolutely all the finalists would have been just as competitive and amazing as the two staff members, full-time staff members that we have, Nicole Mourinho and Janelle Martinez. So if you want to diversify your institution, I assure you the talent is out there in multitudes. Next. Now, we immediately knew that we had to start with artists. The lack of, the lack of having an institutional space at NYU meant that we did not have the ability to host artists like other institutes have been doing regularly. The first artist in residence was Afro-Latinx artist from the Bronx, Celine Rodriguez, which was by invitation. However, pretty soon we have, pretty soon we instituted the open calls. Um, and basically right now we're in the middle of interviews for our next open call, which will be, which will, of artists in residence, which will start next year. And it's fantastic to see how every year we have artists from all over the United States applying, more artists. And this year, 
uh, during COVID, we were so happy to host William Camargo from Anaheim, California, kind of like nationalizing our breath, um, our, 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 our impact. Um, it is especially great to have these conversations and have host these artists and put them in conversation with scholars. This year, we also instituted uh, the Medium Homa, Roman Jimenez Roman Afro Latinx Fellowship. And it's really fantastic to have the ability to have artists not only support their work, but also uh, have them in a space where they could also meet uh, scholars that are represented by vibrant fields in Latinx studies as is Afro Latinx studies. Um, so, um, these selections are made by a team of invited curators and artists and our faculty advisory board, which is also a fantastic process that also helps us to create linkages and also networks and increase the visibility and exposure of these applicants when they're actually, when their files are read by curators and other artists. Next. Um, so here we are, we have had six exhibitions in the past three years. Um, addressing issues of gentrification and, and precarity, the African roots of Latinx culture, issues of settle colonialism, um, indigeneity. This year we had three digital exhibitions due to COVID restrictions, among them cyber healing, exploring how artists find healing in the digital realm, curated by Chiara Ventura, William Camargo's Artist in Residence exhibition, exploring, which provided a corrective, to the, a corrective to the photographic canon centering Latinx subjects, but also exploring issues of surveillance in our communities. And last, Marisa del Toro, which was the winner of last year's curatorial call, cruising the horizon, drawing on uh, the work of our uh, colleague who passed, Jose Munoz, and that focused on issues of queer futurity. All of the ex exhibitions are also the result of open calls that are open to curators, scholars, and artists. And right now we're also in the middle of our interviews for curators. Um, so I'm very excited about the new programs for next year. So let me show you a little bit of some of, of how these exhibitions look. Let's go to the next slide, please. This is the first uh, exhibition uh, and this is how it looks like. Um, I want to highlight that we don't have space. We've been kind of taking over space at NYU. And the first show was at the King Juan Carlos. And I want you to think over the irony of a Latinx show in a King of, King of Spain center with all the ironies that that involved. Um, and here uh, for the next show, for the next slide, you will see a sample of the works uh, that were showed which include um, Roy Bassan, which is Roy Bassan's photography. He's a Mexican-American photographer, which provides assertive and uplifting images of black masculinity in the Bronx, an image of black fathers and their children that you seldom see in mainstream representations of the Bronx. Along with Melissa Calderon's, um, Melissa is a New Yorker artist via the Bronx, uh, and her embroidered cash, which was part of her unemployed life series depicting scenes of economic uncertainty and precarity. Groana Melendez, um, who's a Dominican York photographer, and Groana was one of the artists, by the way, that was included in Museos Triennale. We're very proud of the ways in which a lot of our artists, after showing with us, have been picked up by other shows and oftentimes even got an, um, um, opportunities in galleries. Uh, Groana is one of them. Um, and in this beautiful um, in this beautiful photograph, uh, Mami's Bureau, um, you see a work that speaks to the overcrowded apartments that are the result from higher rents and gentrification, but also uh, speaks of the dreams and aspirations for better worlds that are echoed in the Bureau, um, filled with lavish gold and consumer materials of self-care. Last, you see the work by Carlos Jesus Martinez is a detail of eastbound displacement and installation that speaks to patterns of displacement of Latinx residents from Washington Heights to the Bronx. The story that the artist tells through appropriated objects here of public space, which is actually a sign, stop sign, that also speaks to the growing struggles of a public space in upper Manhattan communities. The next, um, and this was our first exhibition curated by Shalene Rodriguez. Next, we have Afrocene Critique, uh, curated by Yelene Rodriguez, who was a master's student in museum studies when she did this exhibition. 
Um, and you can get us, and this is again the look of the show. Once again, we visited, we, we went to the King Juan Carlos space. And if you could, in the next slide, you will see a range of the works, which include pop art, assemblages, collage, prints, paintings, and more. All speaking about the African roots of Latinx culture, whether it be in food and music, as in Melissa Mistla, La Cocinita, or Lucia Hierro's assemblage of constituent elements of merengue and bachata, Lucio Hierro right now is showing at Charlie James Gallery in Los Angeles, speaking about the incredible um, uh, opportunities that, are, that, that a lot of the artists are getting now. Um, um, or through or, or or through proud and assertive images of the black body, as with Tiffany Alfonseca, um, what a real Barbie looks like, or Fabiola Jean Lewis, Marie Antoinette is dead. Um, all works that talk back and invert the colonial hierarchies of value by highlighting and foregrounding what we what we call el negro detrás de la oreja or the black behind the ear as in Patricia's Encarnacion digital print of the yucca grinder with the European pattern ceramic shaped yucca. Finally, in Seed on Seed, in the next slide, works by Vic Quesada, which was our artist in residence um, in the last show we did before COVID, allow us to foreground the work of a trans indigenous Latinx artist who's the winner of our open call that year. Vic's work are all about retelling histories and talking back to settled colonial past. And in this case, their installation consisted of video and photographs of their performance. A walk through El Paso, Texas around the border, dressing customs, drawing from now wild and Aztec myths with a cedar seeding and reclaiming new memories onto the landscape. Next, sadly COVID has kept us from gathering for over a year. But one of the most rewarding aspects of our work in the Latinx project has been the public facing and public humanity component, creating audiences, networks, opportunities for new generations. The joy of seeing our exhibitions visited by high school and community, uh, uh, community college uh, kids who had never seen artists like them represented in a gallery setting. It was moving to see visitors feeling seen, represented and appreciated. Next. Archives are so central to what we're doing and social media, especially in this current age, um, when being written about is so central to the to the element of evaluating evaluation. It's not all, it's not it's not enough to just be exhibited, but you also need to be discussing this work. And we're creating um, archives that, uh, that are becoming very important for documenting this work. All of our events are available. They can be used for classes. Most recently, we initiated a database of all the artists that we have shown in all of these exhibitions, which is growing, as well as numerous resources on Latinx art. So anybody who would like to learn more about this artist, I really encourage you to go through those websites, um, to go to our website and, and really use these resources. Um, and um, one last key takeaway, uh, next slide please. Um, and my research was the importance of documenting, as I said, I'm writing about our artists. Um, and another uh, way in which we address this problem is through our digital publications interventions. Um, this is a digital publication where we host uh, Latinx writers, original writing criticisms, our exhibitions and on all types of topics. Um, and if there are people in the audience uh, who are art writers, I encourage you to send us pitches. We're always looking for great writers to write about our artists with original criticism on Latinx art, culture, and more. Um, and I will end here um, with uh, a little bit of a sign of our impact, which is our last slide. All of our exhibitions during these past three years have been covered by the press. And I say this to highlight the real impact that we're having, but it's also a testament to the excellence of the creatives we have hosted, the curators that we have given opportunities, but also it's a testament to the great void and the need for these art spaces in New York City and beyond. There's so much work ahead of us, but for today, I could not be more thankful for the opportunity to share some of this work and imagine an anniversary um, another anniversary for the Phillips Collection where this topic and this talk may no longer be relevant because Latinx art is just as commonly known and recognized as American art and as central to the fabric of any museum or institution of the finest order. For today, I thank you 
for letting me share my work with all of you. Thank you so much, Arlene, for uh, this amazing presention. Um, I'm sure a million questions will come. I, um, I was asked, I have to share this with public. I had so many questions and then we kind of met and talked and then Arlene asked me, okay, condense your questions in a very few <laughs> so we can have more time to um, have public, uh, public questions. So that's what I did. And uh, let's start with the, with the project. It sort of dovetails nicely to the book and there's some, you know, it's, it's wonderful what you've done in just a few years. But um, so let's pick up on where you left and um, talk a little bit more about this Latinx project at NYU that is a space and a place for challenging really institutional canons. And in that sense, so, in my mind, um, actually works like a practicum to many of your earlier writings, including the Latinx book, the, the recent book that we were talking about. And I also like the fact that you refer to this as a project, implying an ongoing process, something that is unfinished, um, that is ongoing. And I also like the fact that you were talking about um, this in terms of interventions better than exhibitions or projects or programs that most of us do in, in, in museums and other or institutions. So uh, my question is, <laughs> to put it simply, how did you, uh, given that you started the book, uh, the book was published in 2000, uh, 2020 and that you started this project in 2018, did the two coincide the book and the project or what came first and how did you juggle to do both? What is the intersectionality between the two? Well, the, I, was, I was finalizing the book, the book did indeed, uh, it was an opportunity. It was, it was basically because I did get these opportunities, this invitation to go to another university. Uh, and I basically, I asked, well, this is what I imagine I would like if I, this basically the only opportunity that we professors ever get um, to, uh, to negotiate. And I couldn't imagine um, asking for anything except seeding funds to create a space that we all needed, right? because this has been an ongoing conversation. So I was finalizing the book, but you know, the, this Latinx project really is fed by uh, a larger community. I have been at, at NYU for 20 years and many of us had, had, had wanted a space like this for a long time. And we had organized in one way or the other without much success. So when I had the opportunity as a senior scholar, uh, to me, it was obvious that I had to, to use that little cultural capital to ask for something that we all needed that was important for our community, for Latinx studies at large, not only at NYU, but also Latinx studies is a missing component in most universities. You would have really vibrant African-American spaces in most um, Ivy Leagues, right? And Latinx studies is just not well developed. So, so, so I, I don't want to take all the credit on the idea because it's, 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 it was, it was, it's something that had to happen. Now, the emphasis on art and culture was perhaps, you know, where, where I put that kind of twist, right? The importance of highlighting, of, of centering the arts as, as so important for any conversation um, that, that seeks to have a humanistic space. And I would, I would say that, but um, so it, it coincided and it's not something that I, um, that I imagine would happen at the same time as, as the book. It was just that other opportunity. But I am so thankful that the book was well received and that as a result, that also has allowed some spotlight on the project, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that is kind of karma, good karma that came uh -huh. um, towards, towards the project, which is ultimately what's most important mm -hmm. to me right now. Yes, they certainly work in tandem. That's, you know, that's what I said, a practicum to the theoretical or the research. Absolutely, part of absolutely. I mean, I, t I tell, I mean, I think it's so important for all of us scholars, you know, we get to the point that, you know, like why write, right? What good does it do to write another book, right? Um, as opposed to how do we begin, you know, the importance of actually creating spaces for others, right? And opening up opportunities for others, which I think, you know, I've written like six, seven books, you know, who's reading those books? I don't know, mm -hmm. but right. But, the, but there's that kind of, right, uh, real impact when you're able to open doors of an institution and ensure that there's money for artists, 
that there's opportunities for curators. How, how wonderful is that, right? Because it's not only my voice, but all of the visions of all of these curators and fellows and writers that get to be part of the space, right? That, that, that's, that's, that's the most exciting thing. And I can just imagine as a curator too, securing the spaces that you don't have your space. So you're like a, you know, a, a, a nomad seeking for spaces. That's, that's a challenge on its own. And I'm sure having all these open calls and having to find jurors to, to select, to make selections, to execute things. It's, it's a lot of work. It's a teamwork. And it's, um, what would you say so far, what were the, the biggest challenges you had? And, or, and the, on the flip side, the, the biggest rewards and what's the ultimate goal. Uh, absolutely. I, I want to start with the rewards because, you know, we have to be optimistic, right? And, you know, I always tell that it's kind of shameful, but that in three years we have shown more Latinx artists than most mainstream art and cultural institutions in New York City. And I would say that, and I think I'm, you know, without doubting it, there are so many institutions that have never shown Latinx artists, um, yet we've shown like over 70 in the past three years. So that's been one of the big takeaways. And some of those shows have been reviewed. Some of those artists have secured other opportunities. So that's the most exciting, right, takeaway. Um, the challenges are, of course, space, right? And how do you secure a permanent space in the context of a university that is very complex, right? At a moment when all the universities are, are under retrenchment, uh, we're so thankful that Mellon and Four Foundation have really provided us funding for the next three years, but our battle is for sustainability, to ensure we have an endowment, to ensure that we don't have to continue on borrowed space, but that we can have more uh, proprietary space or that we could have more freedom, right, for our exhibitions. Um, and I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful we're going to get there. But it is, it is, um, it is that that would be the most difficult thing. Right. Um, universities are not at a moment um, where they're invested in these programs. You know, a lot of those programs, the um, legacy projects like um, Center for Black Visual Culture, um, APA, Asian Pacific, those were founded 20 years ago. So we're, we've come late to the party at a moment where universities are not opening up their their um, their support. But um, so that's the most difficult thing. So. Um, opportunities like this that allow me to talk about the project are so important mm -hmm. because it's it's really key. A lot of people think that we are bigger than we are because we've done so much. Yeah, but the yeah. fact is that um, right now we're operating like many other projects, right, uh, in a more precarious way. However, I am very optimistic because I can't imagine going back to what we were before, which was zero, right? Mm -hmm. That's not going to happen. So, so I'll leave it at that. Yeah, it's a long ride, but it's a good ride. And it's important ride. Absolutely. So keep going. But let's let's step back to the book. Um, I, I'd like to reference back and I'm holding it here, as I said, with many notes and many underlining pages, annotated pages. But we talked a little bit about methodology. You referenced to it at, at some point, given that your doctoral studies were in cultural anthropology, yet your master was in museum studies, and also you worked at several museums in New York, including El Museo del Barrio and the Museum of Contemporary Hispanic Art that doesn't exist anymore, surprisingly or not. Mm -hmm. You left that mm -hmm. field and mm -hmm. shifted to cultural anthropology, mm -hmm. an area that centers on exploration of whys and hows of human culture and behavior. What drove you away from the museum world to study cultural anthropology? And how would you say the methodology of anthropology, or as you say, ethnology, driven by direct observation or you know, um, immersion in a setting, differs from art history that is guided by formal analysis, social historical context, iconography, biography, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How can the two disciplines work in tandem and complement each other? That's one question. And in a sub question on the lighter side, uh, your research was really guided by numerous interviews, um, interactions with people, visiting fairs, talking to artists, galleries, um, I'm sure you have many anecdotes to share with us. Maybe you can pick up a few and, and, and on a lighter side and, and oh, share them with us. I, you know, your first question about like, 
methodology. I, methodology. You know, I was, I was, I, I, I say that this is the book I had to write because I have been kind of in the art world for 20, 30 years. I mean, when you think about like working in the 1990s and kind of witnessing the Hispanic boom, the Latin boom, the multiculturalism, um, that's kind of like what made me realize that I was interested in, you know, made me, made me turn from the art world to academic because I was intrigued. I was really interested in those cultural policies, in, in politics, in issues of cultural policy, in museums. Um, and that's actually, I wrote my dissertation on everything else around those issues, you know, really thinking about the cultural politics and those larger issues, the difference between official cultural policy and how people on the ground, what people do, have always been of interest. So uh, absolutely, that's basically why I decided to turn to my, my, my eyes from the art world. Um, also, because when I was working in those institutions, like El Museo del Barrio and Moca, they were very different institutions. You know, they were institutions that were more, right, more informal, more activists. Um, a lot of the people working there didn't have advanced degrees, you know, and I kind of began to see the professionalization of those institutions where you needed to have an art history degree to work there. And I'm like, that's not going to be me. So, but, but, um, but so that, that was, there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of, um, um, experiences that also uh, are reflected in my, in my book because I was able to see that transformation. And I was part of that transformation. I was part of that kind of Latinx archivist history uh, living in New York City. But um, absolutely my, 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 my methodology around interviews, observation is so important because what I provide is kind of a behind the scenes informal script, like an insight into the informal scripts. That's really what's so beautiful about the tools of ethnography is that you're really not talking about, you know, you're really getting a sense of how things are, right? And not necessarily, and you could able to compare with what people tell you um, about the art world. And, and of course the, the gossip, right? The dominant ideas that people don't speak about, but they speak about in the background that are so important to creating value. And, and that dovetails to anecdotes, you know, anecdotes, you know, all the, all the ways in which people reveal the lack of knowledge about Latinx people, ideas that you had to go to Los Angeles to find them as if there were not Latinx people in New York City. I, I think that the most, um, uh, revealing anecdote was this this was was the surprise that I consistently found in these spaces the inability to kind of imagine artists amid among us right this tendency to always imagine that valuable artists are, are elsewhere are either in Los Angeles or in Latin America but not in New York or right like that that to me was um, was uh, a consistent revelation um, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, so you mentioned policies and cultural politics and all of that, and that, that triggers my next question, and that is um, about your book and uh, that asks questions, um, or questions, I should say, the process of evaluation, validation, circulation of art, all the things that art history doesn't actually get into. And in other words, talks about strategies of value and taste making, which is what makes the, arc the market actually functioning and goes beyond, as I said, art history, scholarship, exhibitions, publication, all of the things that we consider cultural capital um, to include patronage, economics, cultural politics, market dynamic, all of this is what, is what the book really tackles. And you raised, in my opinion, some really important um, questions or point of criticism. First, the capitalist production with its um, total corporatization, commodification, commercial, commercialization, including us, uh, nonprofits, academia, and art institution for that matter. And the second point uh, that I found also very, very important and revealing is the critique of globalization process that advocates homogeneity and, and false inclusion. Some of your writings, previous writings also address that. And I, I didn't read, but I want to read the one that it's called El Mall, the spatial and class politics of shopping malls. And reading that title, just I couldn't help myself thinking like, well, aren't the art fairs that are also global phenomena, shopping malls for art in a way. And if so, 
how um, how do we move out of this shopping mentality or shopping culture? Absolutely. And how do we shift away from this neoliberal global, often irregular markets? Absolutely. That serve the most powerful and the wealthy one. I, I, Is that possible yeah. at all? I, I think it has to. We it should be all of our concern. The commodification of art should concern all of us when it results in a narrow win of who can access art, who can participate in it, who can be considered an artist. So we all have to change, challenge these worries on trends that, and, and defend art as a public good, as, as uh, whether it be defending public education, uh, public art education in, in art school, uh, the teaching of art in public schools, defending by having vibrant government funding for the arts at the local, state, and national levels. Um, I think that we really need to push back on the idea that those who have money can shape the conversation around art through their donations, through their collecting practices, through their building museums and endowing curators, right? I mean, that's really what's happening, right? Um, so we need to recognize these trends and be sensitive to them and realize that, right, it's, that's really someone's taste, right? That doesn't reflect um, larger trends, and it shouldn't. We should always push back and, and be informed, um, learn about the, the, the art world so we could see how it works and criticize it, right, and be more aware of and push back against those trends, um, as we try to open it up uh, so that more of us can be involved and defend it for what it is, uh, you know, it's an element of, of human rights that we should all have access to, not only those that have money. I hope that comes. I hope that comes. It has to at some point. Um, um, so before we uh, turn to the public questions and answer, there was one, la this is, I promise it's the last one, the, the question that sort of ties to this, and that is the question of cultural activism today. And we talked a little bit touched on that vis-a-vis -vis the book, but also the, the project. But um, how is this activism related in your opinion and from your experience to the 1990s identity yeah. politics and multiculturalism, both That's struggle to achieve diversity and inclusion? What are their similarities and differences and where do we go from here? I, I think that's an excellent question, Vesela. Um, as someone who actually witnessed and was part of that, I, I really love the fact that, you know, nowadays issues of race and racism are so much at the forefront in a way that you didn't have them or you didn't see them in the 1990s multiculturalism moment when people kind of assumed, by right, this idea of like check mark identity, you have this, you have this program. And, you know, and this, and, and this idea on homogeneity, right? That's why Latino identity, you know, this emphasis on, on looking at what the, the, the commonalities of identity within Latinidad, right? As a way to there, therefore claim a space at the table, right? Mm -hmm. Nowadays, we're at a moment when everybody is criticizing the homogeneity of Latinidad, right? And some people feel threatened by it. But I think it's such a welcome thing when we could say, no, Latinx is just a start to begin to think about indigenous Latinx, Afro-Latinx, all of the different peeling the onion identities that you know, we never talked about before, to talk about colorism in our community, racism in our community, that is so healthy and the sign of a more sophisticated conversation that align Latinx politics with larger anti-racism movements, which is really what, what, what it's all about, right? Um, so I, I'm very excited about the possibilities of what we're seeing today, especially the centered on racism, and, and race in our communities and beyond. So I think that that's the main difference. I don't think the 1990s conversation of multiculturalism was so centered on race and racism, and in fact, may have reinforced racism in the process. Interesting. Well, I'm gonna keep myself from asking more questions and because I see, thank you. <laughs> you and I will continue. Uh, in person, but um, let me just, I see some questions in Q&A, so let me just uh, turn to the public. Thank you all uh, who stayed on for the talk. And I will start with the first question uh, from a colleague. Please compare the goals 
of your NYU Latinx initiative with earlier alternative art spaces such as MOCA and Exit Art. Your book is an important contribution. Yeah, that's a great question. I actually started my career at MOCA. So I have love for that institution. And absolutely, what was great about those institutions where they were really uh, alternative, uh, vanguardist, and they were trying to go against, and they provided opportunities and opening. Um, really, MOCA was so revolutionary in, in that. Um, I mean, I was working there uh, when I had nothing, you know, like, it was like all, you know, Nilda Peraza was like, anybody who wants to work here, come, there's opportunity for us. I mean, how awesome was that? You don't see that in the art world nowadays. But uh, so absolutely, um, what we do is we, we model that, that idea that, you know, we're an incubator of ideas. It doesn't have to be a final research exhibition, you know, like Vesela and I were talking about that, how a lot of our exhibitions, you know, are done very quickly within a matter of a year. You know, we have interventions, we serve as incubator of talent. Um, you know, which is which is really what MOCA and Exit Art and all those grassroots uh, uh, spaces did in the 70s and 80s um, before the professionalization when then, you know, the conversation was much longer. And um, so absolutely, um, yes, uh, we're, we're, you know, I, it's, it's, it's a great comparison um, to be part of that legacy. Yeah. yeah. Um, there is another question. I, I'm, I'm just going to read it. Um, it says, hola. Thank you for your important work and for taking the time to share it with us today. Do you believe there are any unique opportunities Latinx art has that can increase access to art from audiences that don't usually experience it and specific actions art keepers can take to mainstream it and move away from other, otherizing, otherizing, interesting term. Yeah, I, I don't know if I understand the question, but I, but I do think that the goal, what we're trying to do, um, you know, with the Latinx project is, is provide a space, kind of like an index, like, hey, look at these artists. But I'm hoping that everyone is looking at them. And, and I think actually, historically, when you think about how all of these institutions work, and I, I have the example of Pepon Osorio, right, who is a very well-known artist, a MacArthur Fellow. His first exhibitions, you know, were at El Museo del Barrio, and I think actually at MOCA, right, these smaller institutions 20 years ago before they got mainstream institutions, historically ethnic-specific and culturally-specific spaces have been kind of uh, spaces for showcasing work, right? that wouldn't be discovered or seen or experienced in mainstream spaces, but that later become, you know, picked up, right? Uh, we're doing the work. I mean, ideally, it would be great if mainstream institutions have Latinx curators and Latinx scholars attentive to this art, right? So that, you know, instead of having to have Latinx art spaces as the only space to call attention to this artwork, you already had right um, the ability mainstream institutions that would be attuned into Latinx artists or artists of color, right? Because it should be right. That would be the ideal world, and then you could have a great conversation, you know, where you have cultural specific museums working with mainstream institutions, and then there would be a real collaboration as opposed to one being ghettoized and the other wouldn't, yeah, right? Yeah. That would be the ideal world. I was just about to ask you that because I think the, the previous question was, what are the concrete opportunities that you can create? And I think uh, the project at NYU is a very concrete space, but instead of like diverse, um, um, diverging or into two camps, I think connecting people from, you know, whether it's Latinx or Latin American or mainstream institution with, with, the, uh, with more alternative spaces can provide space of unification um, and, 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 and a richer dialogue. And, yeah, and I know, absolutely. Um, and that's why it's so important, uh, social media and uh, the ability to, to uh, to use the social social media to augment and amplify the work, um, and also to have connections with a variety of other institutions, and uh, and that's why we're so happy when when there's media covering our work, right? Because you know when a show gets covered in art news, when a show gets covered in high allergic, which has happened, right? Audiences all of a sudden learn about artists that they wouldn't otherwise have discovered. So that's 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 
that's one of the most rewarding things. But I would add to the to, to answer the, the question that was to you is there is a lot of persistency and a lot of work and time that goes into making something visible. It doesn't happen overnight and consistency of effort and again, persuasion and passion uh, runs a long way. And if there is not that, then 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 we're in trouble. But I think with you, we have that. So I wouldn't worry. Um, another question we have. Thank you, Dr. Davila. Are you uh, facilitating relationship between artists and curators in the TLP and the art market, such as galleries? What interventions do you hope to make in the art market with the TLP and how are you tracking them? Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question because um, because we're in an academic space. <laughs> there were arguments about, you know, um, the distinction between, right, the scholarly realm and the commercial realm. When we know we live in a world where both are intertwined more and more. So uh, on, regard, on that question, I have to say that all of our openings, you know, I see more people from galleries coming to our openings. Um, and I see more people looking at our artists. That's a welcoming, that's a welcome thing. Um, it's fascinating to see queries right that come to us about people wanting to buy the work of such artists that was exhibited and basically what we do is we send them to the curators we we encourage curators to have conversations with the artists whether they have gallery representation and if not if the curator wants to be because we don't we're not going to be you know we cannot use that role Right, we're just an academic space, but we're absolutely a clearing house for those for those requests, right? And we encourage curators to have conversations with artists about those kinds of um, opportunities. However, I would be very excited to participate in an art fair sometime. I mean, right now, as you know, there's so many uh, like Nada or Untitled, some exciting spaces of alternative and vanguard art. That, that also host non-for-profit and cultural spaces and museums. And I would love to uh, take a, a collection, you know, a selection of some of the artists that we have shown. Um, I mean, we're so busy that I, I haven't figured out how to do that, but if somebody's listening to right now and, and mm -hmm. could help us, uh, I think we would be very open because that's exactly what we want, right? We want these artists to we want to facilitate this artist's entry into all the spaces of the art world, and the market is one of them. But how do we do it in a way that is equitable, not exploitative, representative, and that that most of all um, um, facilitates right uh, their exposure without exploitation too? Because the art market, as you know, can also be very exploitative. So we're not, we're, I, I couldn't imagine attending an art fair and demanding 50% of their sales, you know, like, no, that's not what we do, you know, it would be a very, a very, it would be, a, a, I would love to be in, in a, to participate in, in a way that can actually transform the way in which we think about the art, the art market. Uh, perhaps institute royalties for the artists that are, right? Ensure that whoever buys their work, signs contracts that recognize artist royalty, if they buy pieces, you know? How do we, how can we model more sustainable and equitable ways, right? If we participate in those spaces so that we could perhaps change the conversation and, and ensure that art that is more e uh, equal and more, uh, more fair for artists, right? Who are ultimately the ones who create the work and who should be, compensated, most compensated, as opposed to collectors, who, as you know, are the ones who most benefit from the art world, from the, from the art market and the, and the evaluation of the work of artists. Yeah, we're all in a circle and, and I can talk to you separately about certain fairs that could be more acceptable to, to your ideas, um, especially maybe outside of this country, um, referring to Zona Maco in Mexico City or Arco in Madrid that do represent by and large artists from Latin America, U Europe, and United States of Latinx. Uh, so, but there, there are opportunities. And I think as we move forward, we're all looking for more sustainable ways and, and to, to find a way for artists to be um, a major player in the game and not just collectors. Uh, yeah, I also, I also think art fairs tend to be so nationalistic. I mean, the ones you mentioned like Sonamaco and, um, 
and um, and Arco, Arco, right? You know, Arco, as you know, used to dedicate a country, right? A fair to a country, right? But not anymore. No, no, not no, anymore. No, and no, I remember, no, no. I remember having a conversation with the director of Arco. I forget who it was, and I'm like, you know, why instead of dedicating it to a country, you dedicate it to Latinx artists in the diaspora? You know. <laughs> So that was probably a long time ago, but things change. And I think by and large, I want to be optimistic too. Things are changing. The changes we see are much slower than we want them to be. But um, that's just how it goes. And I think it's important to move, move forward mm -hmm. and be patient and just keep doing the work and things will come eventually. They have to. So with that, um, you know, I, I, I just yeah. want to keep that note in. <laughs> Good fate. Um, I want to see if there are any other questions from there's the public. A, there's an anonymous attendee. Maybe should ah, we? Yes, let me let me see. Mixture continues to play such an important and problematic role in race. Can you speak to the role of mixture in the ways Latin American art and Latinx art are maintained as discrete categories? Yeah, I, I wanna I, I wanna speak to the last section of that. Like, can we and, and maybe rephrase the question as can we think of Latin American art and Latinx art as discrete categories, right? Mm -hmm. Given that in fact, right, many Latin American artists come and back and forth, and many Latinx artists also are born in Latin America. And I wanna say that absolutely all categories of identity are made up, right? American, European, mm -hmm. all of that are all made up categories. And it's it's really uh, impossible to think of distinct categories. Nonetheless, um, I was very intrigued at the ways in which scholars talked about Latin American and Latinx art consistently as you want, right? And hemispheric approaches and globalization uh, in the scholarly production. However, when you think about the art market, when you think about the ways in which museums work, those categories are treated very much distinctively. And that's one of the ironies that I talk about in the book, right? Is that, yes, while we recognize that these are more categories are more, more interconnected, right? Or could be more interconnected. And the dream of thinking of them in, in equal interconnected ways, the fact is that there are different historical uh, histories shaping these categories, different actors shaping these categories, different interests, right? And economic interests shaping very distinct um, um, and treating these categories very differently. And I, I, I think it's important for us, particularly that's why I go at length to talk about the the, the ways in which Latin American art was, was, um, was built in the United States, right? Like if you talk to major stakeholders of Latin American art, they will tell you that Latin American art, that they will tell you that Latinx art today is in similar ways to what Latin American art was 30 years ago, right? Um, Mari, Carmen Ramo, Mari Carmen Ramirez will, tell, will say that and has said that publicly, recognizing that <laughs> Latin American art once was just as disregarded as Latinx art, thinking that at some point Latinx art will be just as <laughs> recognized as Latin American art. But, but the, the issue is that before we have, I, I believe that before we begin to argue for similarities, that we need to address the patterns of inequity that have led to this historical disinvestment in these categories. Um, because otherwise, what we're going to do, and you know, in my book, I criticize this formula, this idea that you, the only way to talk about Latinx art is by always having it in conversation with Latin American art. And my intervention to that and my critique to that formula is that pushing that conversation as if they were equal, what it does is of continues to uplift <laughs> Latin American art and doesn't allow for Latinx art to have the institutional emphasis and the institutional uh, backing, right? That it needs to begin to have the recognition that today Latin American art enjoys at the level of, you know, in, in universities where you have so many more people having PhDs with Latin American art, more scholars writing about Latin American art, um, and you don't have anything comparable to Latinx art. 
So I don't know if that answers your question. So the answer is yes, I recognize they're more complex. My critique concerns the issue of institutional <clears throat> investment and how do we begin to address, right? And that's why when I talk about Latinx art, I do so to begin to address that disinvestment so that we could have more fruitful, equitable, and rich conversations between Latinx and Latin American art, which I, I'm hopeful uh, and I would like to, to see more of. So I have to ask you a question, working with a lot of artists from various places in Latin America or United States from Latin American origin. Some artists, or many I would say, do not want to adhere to any label or any category. And many of them actually claim their national privilege in your words or nationality as their own preference of, um, of self-determination, self-identification. How do we how do we look at that, in your opinion? Absolutely. And, and I think also, um, I also think that the art world, it's a very white space, generally, where conversations around our uh, identity and ethnicity have always been disincentivized because there is a price, right, for any hyphenated artist or hyphenated art. So there's always been a push for, right, this idea of universal art, right? I'm an artist and shedding any nationality, right? Because of the particularities of the art world as a field of cultural production, right? So I, th I think that, that that's one of the issues, right, that we, that, that I think we, they need to be looked at as part of this larger structure in which, right? Of course, all uh, nobody wants to be hyphenated. Nobody wants to be marked. Um, nonetheless, these categories, whether it is Latinx art, Latin American art, Black art, African American art, you name it, have been so central, right? To the recognition of marginalized art categories and marginalized artists that what I found in my interviews is this Janus complex relationship with those categories and many of them, right, you know, oftentimes, you know, use them to their advantage, right, in different settings, it's more complex than that, right. But yes, it is, it is part of the larger conversation of a space, right, that has put such a high price to those identities, right. Um, so to me, that's a sign of some of the dynamics, you know, racist dynamics of the art world where this kind of white space, right, this, this unmarked space is what we, we need to all be part of in order to not, you know, to not have our, ident you know, our value compromised as. But, um, but I think also we're living in a moment where we're, what I try to do in the book is ask, why is it that there is this idea, right, that that the world art world is not about identities, right? Like I, I was, when I was doing my work, you wanted an anecdote and everybody told me, oh, but the way you talk about the art world, that's not how we do it. The art world is not about identities, not about race. It's something else, right? It was fascinating, you know, this, this resistance to really address issues that we now know, right? Our, you know, Black Lives Matter has said, hey, you know, we need to be talking about these issues because this is the way in which we address inequities, not by denying that race and racism operates and, and, and you know, but by actually naming, naming the, 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 naming the, um, the erasures, right? So, um, so I, I, I find that among the Latinx artists I interviewed, many of them were galvanized and were more sensitized to, and, and thank me actually, and that, that to me was very rewarding, is the number of uh, you know, notes from artists who said, thank you for describing my experience. Thank you for talking about this. Um, because that's basically what I wanted. Um, I wanted to write a book that at least my community and the artist communities that I've known for a while would, would feel represented. Thank you. I see another question. Um, great conversation. A question for Arlene. Apart from the Latinx project at NYU, the digital and the physical space, where are other spaces as this in Mexico and Latin America? 
And the answer is I wouldn't know, right? Because <laughs> the US, the Latinx project is, a, is about American art, right? It's about saying Latinx artists are American artists. And if you think about Mexico and Latin America, those are right conversations that are in Latin America, right? However, one similar question would be any project in Latin America that is looking at Afro-Latin Americans and indigenous Latin Americans, right? That would be that would be the equivalent of the Latinx project at, at New York City. It's very important to remember that Latin American societies are extremely racialized and segregated around class and race and region. And sadly, in the United States, the idea of Latin American art is very narrowly construed around artists that right that are that are inserted into the national you know networks that tend to be. Um, that represent particular groups that, that have particular classes. So it is, it's not representative of Latin American art. It's representative of Latin American artists who come from elites, who tend to be white from the best classes, have the best opportunities and, and travel to the United States and Europe. Not of the, of the universe of Latin American art throughout regions beyond the capital cities, not of Latin American artists who are Black Colombians or indigenous Mexicans or Peru, indigenous Peruvians. So I, I would then turn to think about, right, where, what are the projects in Latin America that are challenging the white centric <clears throat> definition of Latin American art and beginning to really provide for more capacious and representative definition that that you know artists from you know not from the capitals you know and i saw this in when i went to colombia and buenos aires where everybody could recognize the different artists because they belong to very similar families you know this is this is the legacy of colonialism throughout latin america is that there's incredible exclusion and incredible racism and oftentimes when we talk about latin american art we don't recognize that in the United States. We don't recognize that it's a very exclusive view that excludes Haitians, Brazilians, artists from the non-provinces, Black Latin Americans. That conversation also needs to be had. It's fascinating. I wonder what would the, the two art fairs in Bogota, in Colombia, um, I haven't attended them, but I would be very curious what would be your experience of going there and having these conversations right there in the middle of Latin America. And perhaps, you know, so much is about language. And um, as, I, as I listen to you, Latin American artists, I wonder if there would be less weight on the concept of artists coming from there, if we would switch it around and say artists from Latin America rather than Latin American art, artists that prescribe certain identity. Whereas the other way around, artists from Latin America is much more open and points to certain geographic and cultural place of origin and leaves it on that. And I, again, working with artists from all over the world, I, I hear all kinds of things, but the by and large, the preference is, is to stay away from labels or any specific categorizations. Uh, because it's a personal choice and because for them art raises above all of the things that absolutely have. except when you're talking about racialized artists like black artists right they're going to say you know that 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 conversation is less because some of us can choose to you know not worry about categories right because we could blend in and be universal mm -hmm. and some of us right because of our background race don't have that choice right and I think that that's really what's great. You know, what I try to do in the book is call attention to the racial and class politics of labels and ethnic and racial labels in the art market to push back against that idea that, no, we shouldn't be talking about race and identity because what I learned was that, oh my God, everybody says that we shouldn't be talking about race and identity and everybody's talking about race and identity. So yet yeah, the fact that everybody's talking about that, except that some categories are more marketable than others, sexier than others, more allowed, but everybody's talking about race and identity. I assure you, because I heard it in fairs. I, and, and that was actually one of the bigger uh, anecdotal things <laughs> was exactly on that point that the same people that say, oh, I don't care about identities will exploit their identities when the opportunities arises because the art world is organized around ethnicity around nationality and, and class and class 
but Don't um, that. absolutely um absolutely uh M muriel has done uh just point out that central american artists absolutely another huge exclusion um not only in the category of latin and caribbean in latin american art and also in latinx art so we have a lot of work to do and uh yeah so um, I'm going to call for a last question if anybody has it. We're almost at the end of tonight, uh, but if there is a very last question or a remark or comment or observation that anybody would like to make. Okay. Well, with that, Arlene, we're grateful <laughs> to you and your time. And thank you so much. And um, to be continued. To be so continued, many, absolutely. Continue. Oh, so many grants come and visit us and we'll come to New York and uh, we'll stay in touch and best of luck with all your pursuits and your passion and your dedication to Latinx art. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much, Best Salam. Thank you, Dorothy, and everyone who joined us tonight. We'll see you soon. Have a good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. Bye-bye.